here's my big what if. What if what we're teaching kids and how we're teaching kids doesn't make for a better world? Uh, I'm a teacher. Um, you probably thought I was an oral surgeon or something, but no, I'm a teacher. Any teachers out there? <laughs> teachers in the crowd? Uh, big ups. Big ups for the teachers. Uh, any people go to school? Yeah. Okay, so a common framework here. That's really, that's really good. In my classroom, I have maps everywhere. I have tons of maps everywhere of, of countries, of provinces. Uh, I don't know anything about geography. I'm a joke in my department. Uh, the only thing I know about geography is the term Oxbow Lake. You guys know what an Oxbow Lake is? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I slide that in everywhere. I'll be at a dinner party and I'll slide in Oxbow Lake. And I'm like, you would be surprised at the distance it gives you. <laughs> but anyway, one day I'm in my classroom. I'm packing up. Uh, it's like 5 o'clock, I've had it, I'm done, the whole thing, laptop goes in the bag, and I'm walking out of my classroom, and right by my uh, wall, or my, on my wall, right by my door, is a map of Manitoba, you know, sort of the generic free map you can get, highway and transportation gives you, and for some reason, I, I, for some reason I stop, and I come back, and I'm like, wow, there's Manitoba, uh, I don't know why I did it, and so, you know, Keystone shape, Saskatchewan is over here, Ontario is over here, uh, the United States are down here, kind of thing. And I was like, okay, there's Manitoba, populated areas in the south, not so much in the north, Precambrian Shield, the whole thing. Uh, but then I started to look closer, and I started to look at, or I started to notice First Nations communities everywhere. I started to notice uh, lakes and rivers named after First and Second World War, World War veterans. Uh, I started to notice uh, communities from the Hudson Bay days and the Northwest Company days. And what I realized was Manitoba wasn't these boundaries. That was fiction, right? That's, that's a concept. Uh, what I found, though, was that Manitoba was this living, breathing entity. And when I looked deeper, I could find that. And that got me thinking about how I teach kids and what I teach kids. And what I realized was that I was conditioning kids. I was indoctrinating them, right? I was telling them truths that I was told from my teacher, right? Here's the truth. It's on the board. Shut up. There's a test next week. And so I was passing those on, things like GDP. That's a great way to look at the health of a, a country. Or infinite growth. Isn't that great? Or colonialism. That's something that happened in the past. And I was perpetuating these things, right? And, and at first I thought, well, it can't be me. I'm pretty clever. So I said, oh, I bet it's the curriculum. Right? There's some fuddy-duddy making curriculum in an office, right? cardigan sweater, the whole thing, out of sync with what kids do. And, but then I looked at the curriculum, and I was like, no, it's wicked. The, the, the curriculum's awesome in Manitoba, the science and social studies in particular. It allows kids to explore, think critically, all that kind of great stuff that we're trying to do. And so I said, okay, it's not the curriculum, it's got to be us teachers. And so I went around my school, and I started looking at what teachers are doing, ripping one off what they're doing. I'm like, that's a good idea. Um, <laughs> and... And I, and I said, it's not the teachers, because the teachers are passionate. They want kids to learn. They're fired up. They come to work every day. They're ready to, they're ready to go. So I was like, it's not the teachers. And I was like, oh, it's got to be the kids, right? Blame it on the kids, right? Let's do that. And so I, I looked at the kids. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's not the kids. The kids want us to engage them. They want us to inspire them, right? The kid with his head on the table drooling is like, teach me something that's relevant. <laughs> and so it was me. Right? It was me. I was like, man, I'm a bad teacher. And that was like a punch in the stomach. I was like, I'm just giving these kids models and concepts, not truths, that aren't sustainable. And they're just going to perpetuate it. And that's bad, right? Because is our world in a crisis? Can we agree that our world is in a bit of a crisis environmentally, politically, economically? Yeah, so if we're, we're just going to keep doing the same thing. And so I came to this realization that we need to get kids creating their own knowledge. They need to create their own knowledge and further it. And then the next step, they need to apply it. They need to apply it in the real world. They need to affect change in their community now, not at the end of grade 12 where we say, now become a citizen. They need to start practicing now. And it's my contention that we need, as teachers, whether you're in a school or you're a parent or you're teaching dental surgeons, that we need to create um, environments uh, of autonomy. And what I mean by autonomy is that kids are thinking critically. They're creating their own knowledge. They're developing empathy. They're making ethical decisions. And then they're allowed to apply it in the real world, getting out of the school, getting into their, their community. I came to this realization, uh, I sort of had this aha moment, 
Um, last year, about 22 kids in my grade 9 social studies class, they came up to me and asked me if I would run as their candidate for member of parliament. Right? And I was like, you know, okay, whatever. You know, okay, sure, that sounds great. But, but, but let's, let's, let's step back. When I first met these kids in September, uh, right away I knew that we were a cool learning community. And I, I used that term purposely, a learning community, because I was part of it. We would look at the schedule and say, yeah, we got social studies tomorrow. This is wicked. What are we going to do? What are we going to deconstruct? What myth are we going to deconstruct? And we looked at the uh, economy. We looked at the environment. We looked at um, the political system. And as we started looking at this and sort of deconstructing stuff, the kids started getting really annoyed that they were excluded from our democracy. Right? They weren't allowed to participate in it. And one day in October or November, uh, a kid said, Hey, Mr. Henderson, wouldn't it be cool if we got like a grade 12 kid when they turn 18 to be our puppet and they ran in the election <laughs> and, we could, and we could do the whole sort of, uh, you know, create the platform. And I was like, yeah, that'd be really cool. Good luck with that, right? <laughs> um, January comes around, and we, we're, you know, we're, we're looking at all things political, and we see that our minority government might be falling for a variety of reasons, not because of the budget, okay? And, you know, we're like, oh man, the kids keep bringing it up. Yeah, we should do this. I'm like, right on, find your grade 12 student, okay? Good luck. And then April comes around, and we see that we're going to be coming to an election. And the kids came up to me, and they said, Mr. Henderson, we still want to do this. And I said, right on, who's your grade 12 student? Like, you know, who, who's the unlucky guy or girl? And they said, well, would you do it? And I was like, ah. You know, I could see my principal's face. She's, she's wicked awesome, my principal, but I could just see it like, eh, I don't know, man. Um, <laughs> and I said, uh, well, why me? And, she, and the, the kids are like, well, you got a car. That helps, <laughs> right? And you're going to show up on time to stuff, right? And I was like, okay, that, that's pretty high praise. And I was, like, <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I don't know about this. I'm going to give you a test. And they're like, okay, sure, what's the test? And I said, tonight you got to download the nomination package from Elections Canada, which is huge. I don't know if anybody's done this before. Uh, and you got to get it all filled out. you got to get 200 signatures from the community. Imagine going to your door. My teacher's going to run for member of parliament, <laughs> right? Uh, and you got to get it all filled out. we got to get a check. you got to get $1,000 to participate in our democracy, right? And you got to bring it back. If you don't do it, I'm out. But if you do it, I'm in. And I thought, aha, I got them. <laughs> Because there's no way they're going to do this. There's no way they're going to do this at all. Next day, pouring rain, right? Super, super wet. These kids come from lunch. They'd been into the local community at lunch, which they shouldn't have been. Um, they've got makeup all over their face. They've soggy hair. They had the soggy Elections Canada package dripping. But it was all filled out. They had done it in like 24 hours. And I was like, okay, here we go. Let's do it. And it was just for the first time in my life, I had given up control of my classroom, and the kids did it, and they learned about how to nominate somebody in a federal election in Canada. How many people here know how to do that? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, put your hand down, okay. But, <laughs> geek. Um, but these kids are 15, and so we were off and running, right? We're off and running, and now it was like, oh, we got to put a platform together. Okay, so we're like, okay, what should we be on our platform? One kid's like, we should plant more trees. I'm like, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, um, but as a teacher, I'm like, well, i got to guide them, right? So I said, kids, what have we learned this year? Well, we learned about the justice system, and we were really into restorative justice. Oh, okay, well, why don't we make that part of our platform? Okay, uh, we really want to do something about the Senate, right? All these cronies that get dumped into the Senate. Okay, we'll, we'll look at doing some Senate reform. And on and on. And we, went, we, we started creating this massive platform, kids with ideologies all over the place. And it was this beautiful thing, okay? Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, this is a great project, but where's the rigor? Right? When I went to school, I had to write papers and tests and stuff like that, and it wasn't fun. That's the, well, doesn't that mean we're learning? Right? This was the most rigorous thing I'd seen 15-year-old kids do. They, yeah, you know what? We had to fight over a platform. We had committees that built websites, social media, all that kind of stuff. They got grilled by Winnipeg Free Press reporters. They were uh, on CPAC, talking to CPAC reporters. They were going to community events. They were going to mosques. They were going to debates, and not all the parties went to our debates. <laughs> Rhymes with schmerdative, okay? You get my drift, okay? And it was, I mean, and they wrote papers, right? We did blogs, we did all this stuff. And at the end of the day, I even gave them a mark, right? And it was rigorous. And I, you know, I was like, here, here's your mark. And they're like, oh, mark, what, for what? 
right? It was this beautiful moment where these kids had created their own knowledge, their own truths, not from me, right? I didn't give them the hippy-dippy stuff. They, they did it themselves, and then they applied it immediately. And that got me thinking. I'm like, maybe I could do this all the time, right? Wouldn't this be cool? So I started doing little things. My American history kids last year, they wanted to, or they didn't like the textbook. I brought them Howard Zinn, a people's history, right? I thought, oh, they'll love this. And they're just like, meh. Okay, and they said, well, why can't we write our own textbook? And I was like, okay, let's write our own textbook. So we wrote our own textbook and we published it. Now a 16-year-old kid said, I did history. This is my history. And it was this beautiful thing. My Canadian history kids this year are writing short stories on colonialism and exploration, which is launched April 11th at McNally Robinson. Okay. <laughs> my grade nines are making, they have a podcast series on human rights violations in the world. Okay. These kids are creating their own truths, their nuggets, and then they're applying them in their community to affect change now. And that's fundamentally important. Now, how does this fit with new pedagogy? We know that. We know that kids don't learn with the sage at the stage. That's fine once in a while. Sometimes you have to tell a kid what an oxbow lake is, right? <laughs> an oxbow lake is this, okay? But they learn in so many different ways. And however you get there, whatever, however you teach kids, you have to allow them to explore things for themselves. And you have to create that environment for autonomy, okay? And then the key is you have to let them apply it. Because if they're not going to apply it, you might as well just give them the worksheet, okay? And at the, grade, at the end of grade 12, you might as well say, okay, hope you, can, hope you learned some stuff, now try and apply everything, okay? It doesn't, doesn't make sense. Now, how do we do this? There's three ways to do this, according to me, okay? <laughs> Whatever that means, right? Number one is take, uh, I say, take a little bit off the power pedal as teachers, okay? Take a little bit off the gas. You don't need to be in charge of everything that happens in uh, your classroom. You have to guide, make sure things are safe, make sure kids are able to seek out what's significant. You have to tell them how to do research. You have to model these things, okay? But sometimes... Uh, the kids need to be in charge of that learning community. God forbid. The second thing is, as a teacher, you need to be able to take risks. Sometimes the th stuff that we do in my classroom is terrible and it doesn't work. And I'm like, ugh, guys. And we look at each other. This isn't working. This is terrible. But they like that. They're like, holy cow, we tried something and we failed at it. Uh, but Mr. Henderson, he's an adult and he failed it. Oh, okay, I get it. It's okay. And the third thing we need to do is cultivate this environment for autonomy. We need to give the kids space. We need to, to allow them to think critically, to create that knowledge together, okay, not in little silos. We need to have them do it together. We need them to develop empathy. We need them to practice to make ethical decisions. And the, the, the biggest thing here is they need to be able to apply that knowledge. Let's do a little teacher thing. I'm going to get you to do so. Let's try and create some knowledge. You guys want to create some knowledge? You've been sitting there all day? Yeah. Okay. Big props to the person. And I want you all to try this, okay? Deep breath. I got a, I got a minute here, okay? How is education like an oxbow lake? Okay, talk to your partner. I'll give you 10 seconds. If you can come up with it, you win the tweet of the day. How, what's an oxbow lake? Yeah. Google it, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody got anything? <laughs> a, a curved lake formed at a former oxbow where the main stream of the river has cut across the narrow end and no longer flows around the loop of the bay. Yeah. There you go. You, we don't need to know anything anymore. Isn't brilliant, right? Well, how is education like an oxbow lake? Anyone want to? What's left over after the course is run? It's what's left over after the course is run. You guys like that? Right on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope that that was an idea worth spreading. Thank you.